some see faith and science at war with each other. If you have faith, you don't need science. If you have science, you don't need faith. And I want to talk about that this morning in reference to the book of Genesis. Spoiler alert. I do not see faith in science at war. It is my goal through teaching this class, one of my goals, is for God to use this class to help call us into being more fully human before him. Call us into a true spirituality that transforms the way we see the world. And so we're going to do that this morning as we continue our look at Genesis. And this is our second part of the creation look at Genesis. And this morning I've divided it up again into three areas as I tend to do. Area one, just some basics we need to talk about. Area two, I want to get our theology straight. And then area three, to the extent we have time and we may not, uh, I want to talk about some options on how we read Genesis chapter 1. So, we start with the basics. And the basics for me, what are these fundamental principles that stand behind my understanding of Scripture? In other words, what fundamentals do we have? What's that foundation? What is it that's basic? that you need to know when you hear me, at least, teach on this. And then after we look at those basics, when we look at the theology, my question is simple. What are the important theological teachings from Genesis chapter 1, the creation story? I want to know what the important thing is about what it says about God and us. Because if we lose track of that, we're going to lose the forest for the trees. And then number three, uh, the options. And the options are just understanding that there's a lot of different ways we can read that and still be true to Scripture. So with those three areas in mind, let's start with the basics. What are the fundamental principles that stand behind my understanding of Scripture? Those fundamental principles begin with this. The Bible is God's revelation. I believe that God has gone to great lengths to reveal himself to us in ways that will encourage us, provide us guidance, and ultimately bring us into a right relationship with him. I believe that God's word is inspired by him. I believe as God's word was originally written and given, if we understand it in context, it says precisely and without error what God wants it to say in the manner in which God wants to say it. May not be the manner I'd have written it in. I might have written, look, if I'd have written the Bible, it probably would have lasted about 15 pages. I'd have just said, here it is, plain and simple. Let me explain it. Now go home. <laughs> do it. Or don't do it, depending upon which one I listed. And, 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 and I'd have just said, you know, you're a sinner. You died. Jesus came. He was God incarnate. He lived a perfect life. He died for you. So you don't have to die for your sins. You trust in him. You'll have your sins forgiven. That's only a paragraph or two. But God decides to write in great, detail in lots of different ways because he's communicating not just to Mark Lanier but to the world for history and so when we look at Genesis for example as I told you last week Genesis is written for, for us it's written for all humanity it's this is part of God's word for everyone but if we read it we see it was written to ancient Israel. And that makes all the difference in the world when we try to understand it. 
First of all, it was written in ancient Hebrew. And, and, and so when we read Genesis, if, if we read Genesis, you know, I did a poll one time. I was teaching Genesis. And I said, how many of you believe Genesis 1 should be read absolutely literally? And everybody put up their hands almost. And I said, put your hands down. None of you do. They were like, well, huh. I said, Genesis 1-3 says, Vayomer, and he said, Yehi or. Yehi or. Let there be light. Now, it doesn't say let there be light. It says, Yehi or. That's a Hebrew phrase. Do you honestly think God spoke Hebrew? Do you think he said those exact words when we know the Hebrew language didn't develop until much later? And there are some Orthodox Jews who believe God spoke Hebrew at creation. I've just never met many people who do. It's written to ancient Israel, so it's written in a language that ultimately... And, and, and uh, depending upon some of the timing of all of this, it may have been a different dialect. Some of these vocabulary words may have changed over time as it was written down. But it's written in ancient Hebrew, save for a smidgen in ancient Aramaic. You've got some in Daniel and you've got some Aramaic words sprinkled around different places, including, I might add, Genesis. But it's written in ancient Hebrew. And it uses ancient vocabulary and it's written to people who would understand it in their ancient understanding and we treasure God's word when we read it in context we do a disservice to the word of God when we read it as narcissists who thinks it's just written for us. And so what we've got to do is read God's word, but if we're going to read Genesis 1, don't fail to remember there's a huge distance between when it was written and when we're reading. There's a big difference, distance in culture. There's a big distance in time. There's a big distance in language. There's a big distance in understanding. Look, if I told you I'm mad about my flat, I think a lot of you would understand. Unless we were in England. In which event if I said I'm mad about my flat, <laughs> they would have a complete different understanding of what I meant. Because flat is the British word for an apartment. So we've got to, to take into account these things. We've got to try to hear the ancient world despite our modern understanding. So we've got to travel. We've got to travel not just around the world. We've got to not only go over to the ancient Near East, but we've got to go back in time at the same token. So we're traveling around the world to get over there. And then we're going back in time to get over there. Acts 7.22. Stephen is giving his defense before he's stoned. So this is a New Testament time. This is 40-ish uh, A.D. And he's talking about the Old Testament. And he's talking about Moses way back in the era of the the books of Moses and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians he was mighty in his words and deeds he was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians the picture I've got here is from the Osirion it is from the 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 temple slash tomb if you will of Pharaoh Seti in whose house Moses was raised. 
The paintings that you see are not just cool wallpaper for the tomb. These tell the stories of the ancient wisdom in which Moses was schooled. And it's not just Moses there, but even before, Abraham himself was from Ur of the Chaldees. That's in Mesopotamia. That's modern Iraq. But Stephen also says, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. He was a pagan polytheist when God appears to him. Before he lived in Haran and said, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land I'll show you. And, 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 and Abram by faith does this. So when I say some see faith and science at war, I want to approach this subject, but approach it with the greatest reverence for Scripture. So are faith and science opposite? Opposite ends of a teeter-totter? How many of you all called that a teeter-totter growing up? How many of you called it a seesaw? Seesaw wins. Are they on opposite ends of a seesaw? Well, I got three options for you. Okay? Here are your three options. Option one. Science and faith are opposed to each other. Option two. Whoa, go back. Oh, I was going to put this in if I had time. I think we're doing okay time-wise. Archives of Internal Medicine. An article Janet uh, Seifert and I have talked about before. When patients choose faith over medicine. This was a study that was done. It was this peer-reviewed published uh, uh, investigation. Here's what they said. Conflict introduced by religion is common. These are doctors. It occurs in three types of settings. One, those in which religious doctrines directly conflict with medical recommendations. Those are like Jehovah's Witnesses, especially. Two, those that involve an area in which there's extensive controversy within the broader society. So we have controversy over whether or not this vaccine might work. So I'm just going to trust God and not trust the recommendations of my doctor. That type of a situation. Or three, and this, according to the article, is the largest category. Settings of relative medical uncertainty in which patients choose faith over medicine. So for example... These are patients who say, I trust God more than I trust my doctor. These are patients who refuse a colonoscopy, even though hundreds of polyps were revealed by screening because, quote, she and her daughter believed in the power of prayer. These are people who refused or delayed treatment for conditions, they cited cancer as one of them, believing, quote, it's in God's hands. They refused important tests, explaining, I know God will provide, I don't need the test. A lady diagnosed with breast cancer, breast cancer awareness week, month, diagnosed with breast cancer, declined treatment, saying and said, I will simply pray on it. Now, these are personal decisions, and it's not my job to tell you how to make your decisions. I'm not up here doing that. I just want our theology right. I don't want us to be like the famous preacher story that I'm sure is made up of the floodwaters rising and, and everybody being told to evacuate. And one fellow says, well, I'm not going to evacuate. I'm praying about it. I trust God. The floodwaters continue rising. The fellow goes to his second story because his first story has been flooded out. Somebody comes by in a boat. Get in the boat. It's, the water's not, it's still rising. He says, no, I've prayed about it. I'm trusting God. I don't need your boat. Waters keep rising. 
He's climbing out the window when another boat comes by. No, I don't need the boat. He gets on the ceiling. Waters keep rising. He's on the roof. Helicopter comes by, drops down the rope, grab hold of the rope. We'll pull you to safety. He says, no, I trust God. I've been praying about it. I'm okay. And waters keep rising. And he drowns. And he goes to heaven. He says, God, what happened? I trusted you. God said, don't blame me. I sent two boats and a helicopter. <laughs> does, does God expect us to be people of faith or medicine and science? Trick question, false dichotomy. It's not A or B, it's C, all of the above. So, this idea of science and faith being opposite each other, that is not good theology. That's error. Option number two, science and faith kind of overlap some. Kind of overlap. I don't have time. I'm just going to tell you that's wrong too. That's not good theology. They don't kind of overlap. If it's good science and if it's good faith. Good science and good faith fall into option three. They fully coexist. Good science is a part of a vibrant and real biblical faith. What scripture teaches us and what Genesis starts out explaining to us is that science and the world around us can teach us things, important things, about God. God gives us, and I'll put this in a slide later, but hear it now. God gives us science to combat all of the difficulties and horrors of this fallen world. God gives us science to combat the results of a fallen world, to make life better. If you go to Romans, Paul in Romans 1 verse 20 says that God's invisible attributes, those attributes of God that are invisible, that you, 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 you just don't see them, that's his eternal power, for example. That's his divine nature, for example. God's divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Science reveals the divine nature of God. The orderliness of this world reveals the orderliness of God. The consistency of this world reveals the consistency of God. I don't know anyone I've ever met who said, you know, it was a weird day today. Why? Oh, the sun rose from the west and set in the east. It doesn't happen. God has set this world up. That's like saying, hey, a strange thing happened today. What? Well, God decided only blondes are getting into heaven. No, he doesn't change. He's eternally consistent. And we see his consistency illustrated. He didn't make Harry Potter world. He made a world that, that exists in reason and logic. And it speaks to his nature. A number of people for centuries have talked about two different books that reveal God. The Bible, a book of revelation, and the world, the book of nature. Francis Bacon said, let no man think or maintain that a man can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's word, the Bible, or in the book of God's work, science, the world, physics, medicine, chemistry. Uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, I believe, uh, Frederick Temple in the 1800s, 
said the book of nature, it's like 1850s or so, book of nature and the book of revelation come alike from God. God's responsible for that book. Who do you think made science? God did. The whole creation account is God setting up this world in an orderly fashion. The book of nature, the book of Revelation come alike from God and that he has no more right to refuse to accept what one finds in one than what one finds in the other. He continued to say the two books are indeed on totally different subjects. One may be called a treatise on physics and mathematics. The other a treatise on theology and morals. But they're both by the same author. John Calvin, who by the way I take issue with on a number of things. John Calvin. John Calvin believed that the, when I say I take issue with him on a number of things, one that's kind of funny is he believed that the sun rotated around the earth. And in fact, in one of his sermons, he said, anybody who believes otherwise is demon possessed. <laughs> and they just exist to show us how far man can fall from God. I taught that one time, or I referenced that one time in, in um, I was speaking in England and one guy came up to me afterwards who said, you know, I'm a big fan of John Calvin. And I said, well, so am I in a lot of ways. He says, well, I would appreciate it if you wouldn't drag him through the mud. And I said, well, what do you mean? I said, he said that. Well, don't tell people he said that because it'll lower him in their eyes. He was dead earnest. I said, well, it's the truth. That's what he said. But here, I agree with Calvin. For men are commonly subject to two extremes. Namely, some forget God and apply the whole force of their mind to considering nature. Others overlook the works of God and, uh, and they aspire with a foolish and insane curiosity to inquire into his essence. You know, you've got two extremes. Some will just pay attention to the nature. Some will just pay attention to the word. We need to be both. And we must be both. It's not only part of being fully human, but we are at an unusual cusp of science right now in this world. And the ethical issues demand that faith dialogue with science. I have not seen many science books that even talk about faith. And we Christians need to, not just Christians, Jews as well that are, are, are are Bible-believing Jews. We need to engage in dialogue on these things. I was uh, reading on the internet. And I found out Diane, no, not Diane, what's her name? Her name's Deb, uh, Barbara, Barbara Streisand. She's got a book coming out, a biography. And in the biography, she talks about all these different things, including, she has like three dogs, and two of them are clones from an earlier dog she had. And it just made me hungry, because I scream clones, and I want to go get a Baskin Robbins. I scream clones. <laughs> the ethics of cloning, though, it's something we need to address, we need to talk about. Can I take the genes of Max Bowman and just make another coach? Not that his wife could handle two, but, or the rest of us for that matter, but I mean, do we do that? Artificial insemination. Are there any ethical guidelines to that? What are they? Manipulating DNA. See, I'm going to contend, uh, and, and this isn't the purpose of today, but I am pushing hard every time I get a chance to speak to higher education in Christian environments that we need to be developing a vibrant and outspoken theology of technology. Because every good gift that God has given us can be misused and abused and become sinful. The same nuclear understanding that enables an MRI machine to tell if you've got cancer 
is used to make a dirty bomb. I mean, we can take good things and mess them up and use them for evil. We can manipulate DNA in a way that will help. We can do artificial insemination in a way that can help. But it can also be used in a way that's very destructive, that creates brand new viruses. What about artificial intelligence? John Lennox is coming to talk about it, but they've got it down now where it can imitate your voice. My daughter Rebecca comes to me and says, Dad, we need a family safe word. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, look, it's just a matter of time till one of us gets a phone call and it's going to sound just like you. And it's going to say, I'm in trouble. Here's where I am. I need your help. And she said, Dad, it'll look just like you too if they want to do it by video. So we need to be able to interact and say, what's our safe word? And so it's got to be one we haven't put on the internet anywhere. No emails, nowhere. So we've got it. I, I was fascinated. There's this video that's out on the internet of a gun battle going on a highway right now in Israel. And um, the BBC ran the video. But they also ran with it this. How we verified the video. Because even videos you watch on YouTube can be manufactured with artificial intelligence. They are not authentic just because they're on the internet. It says, a few hours ago, video emerged on social media appearing to show a gun battle taking place somewhere between the Gaza border and Ashdod in Israel. Here's how we verified it's genuine. Huh. Wow, media verifying something before they run it. The video, and, and telling us how they verified it. The video was likely to have been taken recently. Search engines hadn't yet indexed it. The weather was a match for this morning. The video was filmed from different places and angles, suggesting multiple cameras, but clearly depicted the same incident. The highway from Ashdod to the Gaza border is Route 4. When viewed on satellite imagery, it's mostly a straight road with a few distinctive bends. It passes through several built-up areas. The road in the video has two bends and a large undeveloped field next to it. These features suggest a section of Route 4 that could be a match. Following Google Street View at this point enabled us to match several distinguishing features such as trees and bushes, lampposts and pylons and a unique ruin structure in the field parallel to the road. I mean, they go to great lengths. Why do they do that? Because they know things can be made up now. We need to be engaged in this dialogue. Because science has a purpose. The purpose is not to destroy our faith. The purpose of science from God's perspective is a tool for us to use to fight the pains and consequences of this fallen world. So those are my basics that I believe in as I look at Genesis. Now I want to talk theology. I discussed this last week, but somebody asked me to do it again. The ancients used common sense with what they visually observed. So they knew that they lived on land. And they knew that in addition to that land, there was some type of sky, the air in which they stand, but something seems to be up above. They would call that, depending upon which, who it is that you're, you're talking about, um, uh, that's rakia in the Hebrew, but it's the idea of, of a, it's translated sometimes firmament or something like that. But, but the idea is that there's something up there that's solid. And the reason they know it's solid is because you'll see the sun, you'll see stars, and you can't just hang them in the air. Everything that you hang has to hang from something, or so they thought. So there's got to be something up there, and it also explains why there's water up there. Because it leaks out at times. In rain, in dew. And by the way, there's not just water there. They knew there was water under the land. 
because you can dig a well, because you've got lakes, because you've got rivers. And they knew that there was water that bordered at least some of the land. And they figured it probably bordered all of it if you went far enough. This is their thought. This is the language in which Genesis 1 is written. Why the waters get separated from the waters. Why there is a rakia in the sky, in the Shemayim, in the heavens. The land has got foundations that hold it up or it goes sinking in the water. You also have, by the way, an underworld. And it is exactly that, a world under. By the way, even the Greeks believed a lot of this. And that's why the river Styx is part of that water under the world. And if you want to go in the underworld, you've got Hades taking you in on his boat. This is fun, that, uh, holding up the firmament, they had different ideas. The Egyptians thought it were tent poles probably, but some other ancient Near Eastern cultures thought it was the mountains that's holding it up. So you've got different perspectives. This is what Moses was taught. This is from the Osirion right here. This, well, we'll start with the ground. This is the earth god Geb. And Moses was taught the land is a god named Geb who's laying down reclining. His elbows are some of the hills. Now, in addition to him, you've got the sky god, Newt. Or Nut, as I like to call her. She's one nutty goddess. Anyway, the, the sky god, Newt, is up there. And if you look carefully at this, let me move that label away. You can see she's the firmament. She's got stars that are attached to her. Actually, the stars actually follow through in most of the... This is the boat that is the sun. And it's on the waters. These are water drops that are held back by Newt unless it, there's an opening. And Newt swallows the sun at the end of each day. And the sun, she swallows him from the west... And the sun makes the journey back through Newt, actually, and she gives birth to the sun each morning. And so you've got the goddess. Now, now you may be saying, well, isn't she going to get tired of being up there? Well, that's what, uh, oh, that's the sun god Ra going across both sides. But here you've got the air god Shu. And the air god Shu is holding up Nut, and that's the air we breathe. And we can read, I want to read you from the cenotaph, the ceiling of Seti I, in whose household Moses was reared. I want to read you what it says. I want you to see this. This is the creation that Moses had been taught in Pharaoh's house. The uniform darkness ocean of the gods I'm going to highlight a couple of things as we go along that I really want you to, to remember gods the place from which birds come this is from her northwestern side up to her northeastern side open to the duat the duat is that which is beyond creation uh, uh, as we know it and see it it's the big uh, blackness beyond with her rear in the east and her head in the west She's going to swallow the sun when it sets. That's why her head's there. Her rear's in the east because she's going to give birth to the sun each morning. Um, oh, this is great. Uh, uh, it's talking about the upper side of the sky that exists in uniform darkness. That's above Newt. Above Newt. And it's got southern, northern, western, and eastern limits that are unknown. They're fixed in the waters. That's the waters above Newt. In inertness. Now, there's no light of the ram there. Ram was representative of the sun also, the sun god. Um, he does not appear there. Whose north, south, north, west, and east land is unknown by the gods or the ox. There's no brightness there. Every place is void of sky and void of land. That's the entire duat. That's everything on the other side. 
This is radically different than what God says to Moses on Sinai in Genesis 1. Would have blown his mind and would have had huge implications. Her right arm is on the northwestern side, left, northeastern. Her head's in the western acid. Her mouth's in the west. And uh, on it goes. Now, here's the cycle of the sun. Here's what the sun does. The incarnation of this God, because the Son is a God. The incarnation of this God, how this God comes into being here, um, from life in the duat at her second hour of pregnancy. Nuts going to give birth to the Son. She didn't even have an epidural. It's amazing. (laughs) Then the incarnation of this God is governing the Westerners and giving directions in the duat. Then in the incarnation of this God comes forth on earth and having come into the world young, his physical strength growing great again, like this first occasion. If you see the sun coming up, it looks bigger. It's him gaining his physical strength and then it gets more intense as it gets in the top of the sky. And they thought he was getting strong. And then when it starts to go down, it starts looking weak and kind of yellowy, mellow, kind of pink and all of this stuff. That's him. He's, he's just spent, it's been a long day. This evolved into the great God, the winged disc. When this God sails to the limits of the basin of the sky. Sails, sails, because he's on the waters there on top of Newt. By the time he gets to the limits of the sky, at the end of the firmament, she, she causes him to enter again into night. And it becomes night. And this, this is what Moses has been taught. And as for Shu that wonderful little air god, let me tell you about him. Because we, we've got shoes birth as well. Oh, you infinite ones who are at parts of the sky whom shoe made from the efflux of his limbs, uh, that's probably clouds, who tie together the ladder, uh, that's the sky, for Atum, who's a god, Come to meet your father and me. Give me your arms. Tie together a ladder. I made you. I'm the one who created you. I, as I was made by my father at tomb. I'm tired holding up. I've lifted my daughter Newt atop me that I might give her to my father at tomb. I put Geb, that's the God of the earth, under my feet. This God's tying together the land for my father. Drawing together the great flood pulls the waters back from the land. And it just goes on and on and talks about how they were made and all of the rest of this kind of stuff. That is what Moses had been taught. That's the wisdom of Egypt that he had. And we don't have time, and I'm going to divide this up and I'll finish it next week. But the Babylonians had similar views with their sun god Shamash. And I, 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 I... I don't have time. We can look. I looked at it last week, and we'll look at more next week. Um, By the way, I did throw in the John Calvin. I forgot. We will see some who are so deranged, not only in religion, but who in all things reveal their monstrous nature. They'll say the sun doesn't move, and that it's the earth which is moving and turning. When we see such minds, we must indeed confess the devil possesses them. And that God sets them before us as mirrors to keep us in his fear. So within the framework of this, I talked last week about how the, the Genesis 1, 1 and 2 set up the understanding of the rest of Genesis creation story. The earth was without form, tohu vabohu in the Hebrew, without form and void. And God goes about forming the earth and then he goes about filling it. So on day one he forms light and darkness. In day two the heavens separate the waters. In day three he creates land with its trees and greenery and things like that. And then having formed those things, he now fills them. So on day four, he fills the light and darkness with the sun, the moon, and the stars. Day two, he fills, uh, or five, he fills the heavens and the waters with fish and birds. And then he fills the land with animals, creepy crawlies, and people. That is radically different than what Moses had been taught. 
as different as the day is long, and it has profound implications. Let's look at several. First, God may have used ancient words and understandings of what the earth looks like, but he gave us an entirely different message. And that message reverberates from the time of Moses to the time of today. Message number one. There is one God. And he's apart from nature. He's not part of nature. He's not the, the land. He's not the sky. He's not the sun. He's not the clouds. He's not the air we breathe. He's not the frogs that jump out of the Nile. He's not Pharaoh. One God apart from nature. That also means that God is above creation. He's not captive to it. God's not limited by these things of nature. I told you God created a world that follows very clear, consistent laws and that he did not make it Harry Potter world, right? But that does not mean that the God who is above creation and not captive to it can't stick his finger in and make something change miraculously. He has that ability. He can part waters that wouldn't part otherwise. A woman can conceive and bear forth a savior child by the Holy Spirit rather than through a sexual relationship with another man. God can stick his hand into it because he's above it. He's not captive to it. God makes nature. He isn't tied to nature. God is outside space and time. He's not captive to space and time. He made space and time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Space. There was evening, morning, a day, time. That's telling us God made time. He made the seasons. He made the, 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 the cycles by which we live. By which our earth functions. God's not captive to that. He made that. You know, if you compare this to some other stories. Okay, we're just going to have to come back next week and do this. You need to know the story of the Numo Elish. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's absolutely incredible to see how the Mesopotamians put this together. And I'll promise I'll try to get to it much quicker. Because it's got huge implications huge implications. Here's what I'm going to do right now. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. We have a lot to do. I'm sorry. This is a two-hour lecture and a one-hour class. Um, so let's just jump to the takeaways so Dale Hearn doesn't tell me I failed. <clears throat> we will talk more because with utter respect for the Word of God, utter respect for the Word of God, believing it to be absolutely true in what it says and how it says it, I'm concerned that many times we get so caught up in issues of our modern science that we're going to miss the forest for the trees. We're going to fail to understand that the point of this was not to teach Israel how to split the atomic bomb or atomic nucleus. The point of this, very clearly, is to teach certain things about God. And one of them is God is unlike anybody else, any other God, anything else they've ever seen, heard of, thought of, conceived, believed, anything like that. There is no one or no thing like God. God in his fullness, God in his power. The God who, who saw everything that he made and said it's very good. There is no one like that God. There's not a world philosophy, there's not a world religion, there's not anything that will ever produce an understanding of God as great as God really is. And though God has revealed himself to us truly, even God can't reveal himself to us fully because we could never grasp it. So we don't understand God fully, but we do understand God truly. And he's unlike any other. Point for home number two. You have, <laughs> I 
Point number two. You are special. Or I might say, you have specialness. <laughs> you are special. Every one of you. Anybody listening to this message, you're special. God said, let us, okay, my computer's now mad at me for having done that. God said, let us make humanity in our image, in our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over the earth, over every creeping thing. We have dominion. When God made us in his image, now Egypt believed Pharaoh was made in God's image. Horus made Pharaoh. Pharaoh was a god. But Moses was taught, none of you are gods. But in all of you, God has placed his imprimatur, his thumbprint. You reflect God. You are the stone that stands up and says, this is God's territory. This is God's world. This is God's kingdom. You are his representative. You are special. And you should never lose track of that, even if my PowerPoint quit working. My third point for home, God also is interested in you. When we compare other scriptures, old ancient scriptures from other cultures, to the scriptures that we have that are God's holy word, we will see in ancient cultures, some of the gods made humanity because they just were tired of working. You'll see that in, in, the, in, uh, in, in the Mesopotamian stories, the Atrahasis and the Numo Elish. You'll see that, that, that the gods, first of all, the gods make junior gods because they're just really tired. And the junior gods dig out the Tigris and Euphrates River. That wears them out. So they said, we got to do something about this. So they make humanity to do their work for them. God didn't make you do his work for him. He finished his work and rested. God made you because he's interested in you. Brent said nobody's here as a coincidence this morning. Nobody will hear this message where this statement is not true. God is interested in you. you say, well, I mean, I'm pretty good. No, you. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. Our church is not an open church because you do things the way we do them. Because you see things the way we see them. Because you follow the morality and ethics we follow. Our church is an open church because we follow the Lord Jesus Christ and we urge you to get to know him and he'll tell you how to live and he'll tell you what to do. And we'll love you all the way. Because you are special and God has purpose for you and God has interest in you. And when you come into a relationship with him, he starts to reveal it. And if you're saying, well, God couldn't have interest in me, I'm so bad. That's God speaking to you saying, we got to clean you up, boy. We got to clean you up. Because I am interested in you. And I'm scared to death as we look at Genesis 1, we will get so caught up. In certain issues of is it a 24 hour day or not and I'll talk about that next week but I do not want to lose sight of what it's actually saying about our God and about you amen all right let's close with a word of prayer father in the name of Jesus I ask your blessings on all who hear this message that father they will take joy in knowing there's more to learn about you more to learn about your word but they'll take a deep, abiding joy and peace in knowing you and knowing your love for them. Bless them, Lord. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In the name of Jesus, amen.